Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church in the Salt Lake Valley. We welcome you again to an installment of the Ancient Paths. It is our great privilege to have with us this evening Sandra Tanner, the director of Utah Lighthouse Ministries. Sandra, it's very good to have you with us. Nice to be with you. Now, we had you on a couple of months ago, but we wanted to bring you back because uh, April 11th, there's going to be a movie that is premiering called Emma Smith, My Story. Uh, there are billboards up around the valley. There are other things. And, you know, I've, I've been watching in things such as The American Prophet, uh, the, the PBS special that was put out, that the picture that is portrayed often of Emma Smith by LDS today is very, very different from what you see, not only from the historical record itself, but also just comments from people like Brigham Young. And so we wanted to have you on to talk about who was this Emma Smith of history and how does that compare? The, um, the, the production is being done by the same people who did Joseph Smith, uh, Prophet of the Restoration that was funded directly by the LDS Church. And as I understand, roughly an hour of the footage was actually shot for that and is now being released not directly by the, church, by the LDS Church, but rather uh, through an independent group. But it's the same actors, it's, the, it's some of the same footage and things like this. Uh, do you know much about the, the production? That's my understanding that uh, a lot of the footage that was not used in the final one that the uh, LDS Church used will be incorporated into this new movie. So it does use the same actors. It was done at the same time. The film was done at the same time. And um, so there will be uh, a familiar uh, aspect to it. Those that have seen the other movie will recognize the same actors and much of the same setting and clothing and everything as was in the Mormon version. Now, the last time that we had you on, we had some we had some very positive feedback, but we also had some angry emails because <laughs> uh, we were told that we were now departing. You know, we've been teaching just the Bible mm -hmm. before, and now we were directly challenging the LDS. And you know, I'm, I'm wondering if this is something just isolated because, you know, from from our perspective, uh, the the Mormon Church is founded on the first vision. Right. And in that first vision, which is taught by thousands of missionaries every day around the world. Joseph Smith is told he should join none of the churches because all their professors are corrupt. All their creeds are an abomination. Uh, he, he gave very detailed statements that the churches were all apostate, uh, mocked them in, in very derisive terms, said that he was re restoring the one true church to the earth. Uh, the, the testimony that he gives in his history, he says to his mother, I've learned from myself that Presbyterianism is not true. Now, I'm a Presbyterian. You know, from, from my perspective, we're making a truth claim. And people have the right, when someone's making a truth claim, to challenge it. So when LDS challenge it, uh, we don't go off in a corner and whine and cry that we're being picked on. Uh, they're free to challenge that. But when we turn around and counter their truth claim, when they say Presbyterianism is not true and Mormonism is true, it, it's... Uh, you know, I keep getting this response from people that somehow I'm being unfair, that I'm picking on them, and they're, they, they, they're the, the victims in all this. You know, we, we work hard not to demonize LDS. We work hard to be respectful, but they say Presbyterianism is not true, and they say that if you want to know Jesus Christ, if you want to know the real gospel, you have to go to the LDS church, and you have to leave the Presbyterian church. Um, we disagree. We think that Joseph Smith was a fraud and that what he was saying was, was was untrue. Now that doesn't mean that we think bad things and make up all kinds of stuff, but we, we try to engage people. But every time I try to engage um, people, a, a significant number, it seems like they're, they're, they're playing the victim. It's like, oh, you know, we're being persecuted. Mm -hmm. we, you know, you, you know why, can't, why can't you just stick to the positive things? Well, every day they're out saying these things about us, their own scriptures deny it. You know, is, is this an isolated thing or am, am, is this a, no, a common reaction? <clears throat> anyone that deals with critical material on Mormonism uh, is given that same kind of feedback from the Mormons. You know, why are you persecuting us? Why are you picking on us? 
But I think people need to realize that uh, our country was founded on the principle of free speech and the ability to defend and believe whatever one wants to believe. But there also has to be an exchange of ideas. Uh, That's part of our country's founding idea, that you could share a whole different perspective with someone else, and you have the right to do that. I think it's something we especially need to worry about in today's world, where you try to make everything just be milk toast and uh, love and kisses and we all get along. Uh, I don't think people realize how close that comes to starting to back away from our founding fathers' view of liberty and free speech. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in Canada here just recently, a ministry that dealt with both Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witness was shut down by the Canadian government because of promoting what they said was hate speech. And they're just a normal kind of ministry. I mean, they're, there's not rabble rousers or anything, you know. Uh, Lori McGregor's ministry, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. hers, uh, but they were shut down. And uh, because in Canadian government, all churches have to be treated equally. So I think that uh, Mormons that want to say we should not be discussing the other side of the issue need to realize we have very firm uh, rights in America, and I hope they wouldn't want to change that. Yeah, it seems like you know if you're if you're making a claim that you would want to invite challenges so that you could prove the validity of it. I mean, when we make a when we make a truth claim, we don't right. simply say, you know, uh, how dare you challenge us. You know, if I say that the American uh, Civil War took place in the 18th century, uh, well, that's demonstrably false. I mean, that's mm. something that we can test. Right. The, and so when people make these challenges, it, it seems like it's going to be interesting to see what happens on the flip side because the LDS Church is saying all these things negatively against everyone else. So how is it that they're going to be able to you know, is this is this really going to be a vic- victory for them that they've shut down their critics and yet they're criticizing others? So, right, yeah, so it doesn't well, make sense. <laughs> well, you know, the, the main focus I want to, to go through this evening is on Emma Smith because mm-hmm. the, the, the picture that I see presented in terms of uh, the, the Joseph Smith film uh, that was done by these same people and American Prophet and all, it, there's a picture presented of, um, of an idyllic relationship uh, that doesn't seem to correspond with a lot of what we know to be fact from Emma herself and from, from Joseph and from Brigham and from others. Um, you know, the, the, the Joseph Smith picture presents the meeting as Joseph is just sort of amb- you know, ambling down a country right. road and he just happened to be in that part of uh, right. Pennsylvania. Is, is that how they really met? Well, no, you have to go back and look at how Joseph Smith's childhood played out. His family uh, ended up in the Palmyra, New York area. They'd originally been in Vermont. But in New York, the family had got involved in magic and money digging. It was rumored that there were pirates that had, like Captain Kidd, had buried treasure somewhere in the area. So there were different people there out looking for the treasure. The Smiths got involved in this, um, and I mean, if all they were doing was looking for a buried treasure that was rumored to be in the neighborhood, that wouldn't be the problem. It's the method they used to find the treasure. And Joseph Smith was digging a well for a man by the name of Stoll, and um, he found this stone that he thought had peculiar properties, and then he claimed it was sort of like a crystal ball. And so he'd put this stone in his hat and pull a hat up over his face, and then you could pay him to walk over your property and see if there were buried treasure there. And he supposedly would find it this way. And so this really comes down to magic, which is forbidden in the Bible. Uh, and uh, during this magic routine, when they would think they found a treasure location, they would form a magic circle and you had to do a special ceremony to bind the spirits. I mean, this is all gets into necromancy and uh, things that are very much <laughs> spoken against in scriptures. Uh, But Joseph Smith got involved in all of this sort of thing. Well, because of his fame as the guy that looked in the stone, not just the guy that helped you dig, the guy that looked in the stone to tell you where the treasure was, this fellow down in Pennsylvania area came up to hire Joseph to come back down to his place to help him look for a silver mine that he thought was hidden somewhere. And so when uh, Joseph and his father go down to Pennsylvania, they board 
with a family with the last name of Hale. And that's how he meets his wife. So in the Joseph Smith movie, uh, it's never explained why he ends up in Pennsylvania to meet Emma, but he's there boarding in the home. And the father is uh, at first open to whatever the Smiths are doing, but after a little bit of time, he becomes disillusioned and decides this is all a scam. So when Emma and Joseph start getting romantically inclined, the father says, no way. Uh, I mean, Emma, this guy has no visible means of support. He just runs around the countryside with his head in a hat looking for buried treasure. So Joseph and Emma uh, elope, uh, and a Mormon that knows a little of their history may know that they elope, but they don't know why. And the movie never explains why. And I don't assume that the movie on Emma is going to explain why that it's because the father objected that Joseph had no regular job. Well then, uh, after the marriage, Joseph tries to reconcile with the father and promises the father that he will give up money digging. But what does he do? Then he turns around and says, oh, okay, I've given up money digging, but by the way, an angel showed up in my room and told me about this buried treasure, uh, the gold plates, and now I'm translating a book of scripture. That didn't go over a whole lot better with the father than the money digging did. Now, a lot of these claims were historically challenged by the LDS Church, correct? That G Joseph Smith was involved in money digging and things like this? Well, they used to uh, object to that story, but you'll find their historians today generally concede that. And Richard Bushman, in his new book, uh, uh, Rust Home Rolling, Rolling. Uh, in it, he concedes the Smith's involvement in the money digging story, and he admits that Joseph was arrested uh, on the money digging problem and um, the judge on his court papers wrote down Joseph Smith the glass looker which shows that the whole case was about his looking in the seer stone. So the Mormons will concede that today but then now they argue well yes but there's no evidence that he actually was found guilty. Well regardless of what, how the case ended we believe that he was uh, just turned loose at the county line since he was underage. But the point is, he, it's proof of his involvement in this magic money-digging activity, and it's why the father objected to Joseph as a son-in-law. So the, but then the amazing thing is the same stone that he's using for the money-digging turns out to be the same stone he's going to use to translate the Book of Mormon. And so that's where the Christian comes in and says, wait a minute, uh, you, you can't say this is a guy that repented of something in his youth and now he's been called of God. He was using this stone in his hat through the very period, supposedly he was being groomed by an angel to translate the plates. It's, it's all within the same time frame. So I don't see how one can argue like some histor Mormon historians have done that you know that was a childhood teenage thing and then he repented and then he went on to his prophetic call. They overlap. And it's not just a few court records, but there's actually sworn affidavits given by people like Emma's father, Isaac Hale, right. uh, that go into great detail about all these right. things, correct? All the neighbors, yes. There are many statements about his involvement in the magic money digging business. So what was her background? That What was she raised? She was raised Methodist, as I recall, and I assume was a pretty normal kind of girl. Uh, she evidently was attractive. Um, still single at 21, so she obviously was uh, someone that would have had her choice of husbands because she was an attractive woman. Even in her midlife, she, you can still see in her face the, the, an attractive facial features. So I'm sure she could have had her pick. So here she waits all this time to get married, and you know I'm sure her father just has to be dismayed <laughs> that she waits all this time for Mr. Wright and then, then marry some guy with no visible means of support, you know. <laughs> So basically, uh, when, when Isaac Hale is away, Joseph comes, takes her away, they elope together. Uh, what was their early life like? Oh, it was sad. Uh, because they eloped, they go up to his folks' house up uh, in the top part of New York, and um, uh, they're up there for a few months, and then uh, they, it, Emma wants her furniture and things from the father, and she gets some of her stuff. Uh, then finally they work out an arrangement to go back and live with the father on the father's land and have this reconciliation where Joseph promises he's going to give up money digging. Uh, they move into a house that was on the father's property and make a deal with the father uh, contract 
to in time buy 15 acres of land and this little house that they were staying in uh, but they're only there a short while working on the translation and then they leave again and go up and live with the Whitmers up on the north side of New York again and from then on out it seems like for a long period of time for years Emma is just dragged from place to place she has a very sad life um, her first child dies at childbirth um, and the next child I believe dies uh, she adopts some twins and a couple of years later that boy dies very sad uh, uh, motherhood issues but besides that her husband's moving her all over the country they back and forth from New York to Pennsylvania and then he takes her off to uh, uh, Kirtland Ohio and uh, over to far west and uh, back over to Illinois uh, you know it's just there was an awful lot of turmoil in her life a lot of poverty uh, a lot of sadness with her children uh, she's a very sympathetic figure uh, I will say for Emma that she, all reports of her say she was a very devout mother, uh, a godly woman uh, as far as, as her manner of living. Uh, she was faithful to her husband, and yet he didn't pay her the respect back of being the same to her. But uh, she tried in every way to fulfill her obligations and covenants to him, and yet we find Joseph lying to her about polygamy. Uh, it, it's really sad to see how she struggles through her life with polygamy and wanting to love her husband, wanting to believe he's a prophet, and yet having this conflict all the time. In The American Prophet, which I've, I've not had the opportunity to see the, the movie that's being released, they, they've just done, I've seen snippets of it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the Joseph Smith movie that uh, was done by the same people. It seems like there's this just uh, sugar wouldn't melt in their mouth kind of mm -hmm. relationship right. between each other. But what the reports that we get from other people, there really wasn't that uh, great joy in all these circumstances, <laughs> where especially with polygamy. Right. I, uh, there, there were times when they had a good relationship. But like I said, I mean, he's moving all over. He's at different times running from mobs, running from the law. Or what, I mean, she's left alone a lot and all of that. But then, in, like in Kirtland, in 35, you start having these rumors that Joseph had uh, an affair with Fanny Alger. Um, and well, there's some evidence that Emma was aware of the thing with Fanny. Uh, now, the Mormons will make Fanny his first plural wife, so whether you want to make it an affair or a wife, it still was done without Emma's consent and behind her back. Um, and if the reports are true, I mean, she may have even seen them in the barn together. Um, and this was a great trial in their marriage. Then uh, Joseph seems to have backed off from at least what we can see publicly of much involvement in polygamy until he gets to Nauvoo. But then in 41, he marries a single woman, Eliza Beeman. But this again is done behind Emma's back. Well, there starts to be rumors about polygamy and the Mormons are making denials about it. And then you have a man by the name of John C. Bennett that comes into Mormonism and he's a rising star. Within a year, he's mayor of Nauvoo and gets Joseph's confidence. Now, the question is, did Joseph teach Bennett polygamy or did Joseph just uh, live it in such a way that Bennett figured it out? We don't know, but Bennett started going around and proposition propositioning different women and made problems for Joseph because Bennett was doing it carelessly where people were much more aware of what was going on. And um, so then Joseph has a big confrontation and puts Bennett out of the church, and Bennett leaves and writes an expose. Well, okay, so Emma's got to be aware of all this rumors, or at least some of it, and she's got to be aware of Bennett's book. She has to be aware that there are these rumors that he was, Joseph was practicing polygamy and teaching this doctrine. But Joseph's public statements are denials. So you have this um, tension going on in their home, he, Joseph didn't even dictate the revelation until 43, another year later. Uh, by then, he's already had a number of women sealed to him in polygamy. Some of these women, Emma figures out. And so you have fights that happen. Uh, in the book on Mormon Enigma, uh, Emma Hale Smith, 
in this biography of Emma, they tell of different times when Emma and Joseph had fights over polygamy, great arguments, times when Emma was threatening to leave him and go back to her family in New York. This was a, a great turmoil for her. So some days they were this happy, loving couple, but some days they had some great battles over this, to the point that Brigham Young claimed that Emma tried to poison Joseph Smith at one point. He also said at General Conference uh, years later that when the revelation was given for polygamy that she took it and threw it in the fire, correct? Mm -hmm. and, that, right. and, that, and that consequently she would burn in hell. Uh, I mean, there was a great antipathy between uh, Br Brigham Young and Emma Smith. Right. We'll, we'll get more into that, but, the, uh, but after all of this, in 1860, there's the, the reorganized uh, mm -hmm. Church of Latter-day Saints, and the uh, Emma actually claims that Joseph never practiced polygamy, right? Right. Well, yeah, this is a funny situation with Emma, because Emma had to know about polygamy, and there's two women that married Joseph, uh, two sisters, the uh, Lawrence sisters, tell how they had married Joseph first in polygamy without Emma's knowledge, and then finally Joseph had convinced Emma to, t to let him take plural wives, and she said, okay, you can marry the Lawrence girls. So they, since he'd already married them, <laughs> instead of telling her, well, you'll have to pick two more because I already married them, <laughs> uh, instead of doing that, he says, okay, and so they have a second marriage. And the girls themselves tell this later in their life, that they had a second marriage uh, for Emma's benefit rather than tell her they'd already married. So Emma knew about polygamy. Okay, so when, when Joseph dies, Emma's already mad at uh, Joseph and Brigham and these guys for going into polygamy. But after he dies, the church isn't taking care of her very well financially. She's left destitute with Joseph gone. And so she's really mad at Brigham now. So there really was some very great tensions. Well, when Brigham took the majority of the Mormons west, not all Mormons came west. Some stayed in Nauvoo. Some didn't believe in polygamy. Some were dissatisfied uh, with the whole lot, didn't know what to do. And Emma was one of those that stayed behind. Well, in time, uh, in the 50s, some of these people that stayed behind got together and started forming an alternate church. that wanted, They wanted to be the church of Joseph Smith before he brought in polygamy. Well, they in time then pursued... Emma and her children to come into their movement, since they didn't go with Brigham, would they come into this movement? And so Emma takes her sons into the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and her oldest son, Joseph Smith III, becomes the prophet for their church. So then years later, the son interviews his mom and asks her specifically in this interview, uh, did dad practice polygamy? No, he didn't. Did he ever give such a revelation? No, he didn't. Were you his only wife? Yes, I was. And, and so there's this long interview of this. Emma knew better than this. I think Emma's trying to save a place for her children. Uh, it's her way of getting back at Brigham Young and Joseph, whatever. Anyways, it, it's a lie. It's a misrepresentation that she has to know about. Um, but it's saving face. We're going to go ahead and open up our phone lines. If you would like to uh, ask some questions, join in the conversation here. The phone number is 973-TV20, that's 973-8820. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the reorganized uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They've changed their name now to right. what, Communities of Christ? Community of Christ, yes. Uh, I actually have visited their temple in mm -hmm. Independence, and frankly, it's one of the strangest things I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, because <it> is. <laughs> Because you get to go in the temple. Yes. And I wasn't really clear on what the whole purpose of having a temple was since they deny celestial marriage and exaltation and polygamy and all these other things. I mean, do they as a body, I know there's probably a spectrum of belief, but is it your impression that, that as a body they actually hold to the historicity of the Book of Mormon? The leadership, I don't believe, looks to the Book of Mormon as history. Many of the followers do, but the leadership are backing away with all things Joseph Smith, <clears throat> hence the change in the name of the church. I was back there about a year and a half ago and uh, talked to the lady there in the visitor center, and 
she was indicating that uh, the leadership generally uh, don't consider the historical issues important, that it's all, uh, you just look at it as scripture and it doesn't matter whether it's history or not. So they're kind of passive about all that. But there are some of the people in the church that thought it was pretty important and they broke off. And so you have a number of splinter groups of the reorganized church now out in independence that believe the Book of Mormon is history. And they feel like their leadership has sold out on them and is taking the church away from Joseph Smith, which they are. I mean, they are moving that way. Historically, the, the reorganized church would describe the Utah church as having departed from the teachings of Joseph Smith. And they, they would very strongly deny that he had ever advocated polygamy in any way. But that has changed in the last 30 years, hasn't it? Yes, the reorganized church historians now generally will admit that Joseph Smith was somehow involved in the polygamy uh, activity in Nauvoo. I think they're still a little careful how far they'll go with it, but they accept now generally the outline. <laughs> of, I mean, the, most historians in the reorganized church would accept the biography of uh, Emma as being historical. And this biography clearly is showing a very polygamous Joseph Smith. Uh, so the, the leaders are really, um, in the reorganized church, have come a long ways. Originally, their foundation argument against the Utah church was Joseph never, never taught or practiced or lived polygamy. So it's a complete turnaround. They also insisted that Joseph intended his successor to be his son. Yes. And, that's, and that position of prophet has been held by the descendants of Joseph Smith up until very recently, hasn't it? Right, yes, their president that they have now is not a descendant of Joseph Smith, but for many, many years that was the pattern. We have with us Jed from Salt Lake City. Jed, good to have you with us. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. My question's for Sandra. Um, it has to do with the Book of Mormon and, well, first the three witnesses, Oliver Calvary, uh, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris, what happened to them? And then on the eight, you have uh, four more Whitmer, Whitmers, you have three Smiths that are all related. And how come none of them ever become presidency or prophet or anything, and especially the first three? Okay, thank you for calling. Okay, on the uh, first three witnesses, you have David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and uh, Martin Harris. and. All three of them left the Mormon church in the 30s. However, uh, uh, Cowdery and Harris later came back into Mormonism, but that's a long story. I don't know that that means much. Uh, Whitmer never came back into Mormonism. He always believed the Book of Mormon, but he never came back to the Mormon church. Uh, he believed Joseph was a fallen prophet and that everything after the Book of Mormon was wrong. So you have, um, that takes you to those three. Then you've got the other witnesses. Uh, some are Whitmers, which are David Whitmer's uh, brothers and his father, I believe. And then there's uh, Hiram Page, who marries a Whitmer girl. In fact, Oliver Cow Cowdery married a Whitmer girl. So there's kind of a relationship amongst that family. Uh, of course, all the Smiths stayed in the church. But by 1838, all of the witnesses had left Mormonism except the Smiths. Now, that didn't, doesn't mean they all gave up the Book of Mormon. They went into splinter groups. Uh, but yeah, none of them ever went on to become anything of important in the church. You described how Joseph Smith was using a hat with the stone in it to go around and try to find buried treasure. Uh, was it Cowdery or uh, who was it that said that that was the same method that he was using. You know, the, the, the picture is often, uh, I think, uh, put forward that Joseph is sitting here with the golden plates mm -hmm. and he's reading the golden plates and he's dictating to his transcriptionist mm -hmm. what to say. But the reality was that according to the transcriptionist, the, the plates would stay in the box and he was actually putting his face in the hat, looking yes, at the rock. Both, both David Whitmer and Martin Harris uh, and Emma Smith, for that matter, all describe the process of putting a stone in his hat, just like he did his money digging, and looking into this hat, uh, not at the plates, he's looking in this hat. And then the witnesses said 
that as he looked at the stone in the hat, it would be like kind of like a crystal ball. And uh, the writing uh, of the English for the Book of Mormon would appear on the stone, and he would just read it off like reading a ticker tape or something, you know, a uh, computer printout. He's just reading it off to his scribe. So what they describe is not a translation in the sense that anyone thinks, you know, that you're sitting there studying the words out and trying to figure out how to word it into English. They're talking about something that's divinely given every word for the Book of Mormon, which leads to the problem of why do you have to make any corrections in the language later on if Joseph's reading every word off of the stone just as God wants it to be, then it makes God using very bad grammar. Uh, the Book of Mormon is just full of bad grammar. It is obviously in the language of, a, a very, of someone with very small uh, educational background <laughs> because of the grammar and spelling in the book. Uh, so it doesn't match. The, what you en end up with as a product compared to how he says he gets the translation, uh, it doesn't seem like it would be God's product. We have with us Elizabeth from Leighton. It's good to have you with us. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have your question? Yes, I do. Uh, are there, I've never heard of any descendants of Joseph Smith like his children. Did he have children from he, his polygamist wives? Well, we don't know about the polygamist wives. Uh, one of the polygamist wives said she knew of uh, at least three or four kids that were supposedly Joseph's children. Um, but you had a situation where some of his wives were married women, which if there was a pregnancy involved at that time could have been cloaked in a marriage. Uh, you could have easily given children to someone else to raise. I mean, after all, this was against the law in Illinois. It's not something you want to parade around. There was no public acknowledgement of polygamy. Joseph was trying to keep it secret so he wouldn't get put in jail. So if there had been children, we assume that they were adopted out or abortions were performed or the women were sterile or they passed as children of their fathers because some of the women were married. Thank you. If, could, could I ask one more question? If, where did the Book of Mormon come from if you think he was phony? I think he invented the Book of Mormon using all kind of material around him. The Book of Mormon represents the common thought of his day. There were a number of books out at that time theorizing that the American Indians were the lost tribes of Israel. And so Joseph just comes along and fills in a void of what people were already thinking about the Indians. And uh, in his area, some of the Indians had a legend that they once had had a written record. And so he's fulfilling this expectation by coming up with this record. He utilizes the Bible all through you have uh, rewrites of Bible stories in the Book of Mormon where Nephi seems to be modeled off of Joseph in the Book of Genesis. Alma seems to be, Alma the Younger is modeled after Paul. So uh, you have in the Book of Mormon a story about a woman dancing before some guy to get some guy's head on a platter, which sounds a little bit like John the Baptist story to me. And so I see him utilizing common theories of his day, Bible stories. I think he used the Apocrypha. I think he used the Westminster Confession. All sorts of things to amalgamate to make his story. I think he was a very good storyteller. It, it's just not history. Thank you. Uh, we have with us Monty from Mount Olympus. Uh, Monty, good to have you with us. Hello, praise the Lord. I'm just up on top of this mountain overlooking your fair city. I'm a gold digger. And I've watched many of these types of programs. I have a remote TV, a little uh, TBN, and some TV20, some Sean McCready, and I love your show, too. Thank I would you. like to extend a thank you to Sandra for coming forth with the truth. All right. Here's my question. When Jesus told us to go into all the world, raising the dead, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, casting out demons, setting the captives free, there's actually some more to that, but... Uh, What's our problem? Where is the priesthood now? Among your children are crank addicts and tweakers and suicide cases, third and fourth times to the hospitals. When I come down off the mountain, I bump into these people. The Holy Spirit leads me straight to their heart, and we get them fixed. The intensive care people in your hospitals, they know who I am. I come in there, and I give them the straight deal. In Jesus' name, stand forth. I have no priesthood, I have no name, I just love Jesus and I do what he told me to do. Now, I recommend that this 
next great city here in America in the end of days, call forth a contest. Let's find out which one of you is really telling the truth. I'm sick of the arguing. I'm sick of the crap. I'm sick of the wars and the rumors of wars. It's time for Jesus to reign. I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, he's quoting from uh, Mark 16 with, you know, these things will follow those that believe. And the, the discussion there is fulfilled in the apostles. Uh, the apostolic age ends. You don't see them putting forth new apostles, but rather Paul is, is appointing elders in every city. And, you know, we, we've, we've alluded to this in some other shows, but uh, we'll, we'll pick it up in some other ones. Uh, but we'll, we'll, let's keep our focus on Emma Smith. We've got, we have Mike from Midvale with us. Uh, Mike, good to have you with us. Hi, good. How are you guys doing? Doing well, thanks. Uh, my question is for Sandra. Uh, do they know ever uh, what happened to the uh, lost part of the Book of Mormon when Martin, Henry, Martin Harris ended up losing part of it? Does anybody know what ever happened to that? Well, not exactly, but for our viewers that don't know the history, after Joseph Smith started working on his translation, um, Martin Harris, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, was going to help finance the book. And his wife was not convinced Joseph had any prophetic ability and thought her husband might be getting conned. And so Martin thinks if he could just show her part of the manuscript to see what they were doing, she would realize this was worth a worthwhile venture. <laughs> so he convinces Joseph Smith to let him take 116 pages of the original manuscript for the Book of Mormon back home to show his wife to get her behind this project. Well, the pages come up missing, and no one knows what happens to them. Uh, the assumption is that Mrs. Harris burned them. And... Uh, of course, her thing to Martin is, well, if he's a prophet of God, all he's got to do is write them all over again. He's got a stone. He can translate it. Just get it again. There's no big deal. And so if he's a prophet, just let him produce it. Okay, now Joseph's stuck with the problem. I, From my perspective, not believing he's a prophet, I can see Joseph sitting there thinking, oh, brother, I've got a big problem now because I haven't saved my notes. I can't rewrite the whole thing, and I can't do it exactly like I had before. So I'm going to be found out. So I've got to come up with an idea of why it's not going to match. Because in Joseph's mind, he thinks that Mrs. Harris may still have the pages. And he can't do it the same again. So he's got to come up with an answer in case she still has the pages, why it's not going to read the same. And that's when he comes up with this idea of having a small set of plates and a large set of plates. And if they're, you're Mormon, you've probably heard this story. Uh, and before he'd been translating the big set of plates, and now God tells him, well, that was just the historical part. Now, instead of going and doing that part again, I want you to use the small plates because those are more religious. And, and I don't know why God didn't tell him to start on that in the first place. But anyways, now he's supposed to switch and do the small plates, and that will explain why they don't read the same because he's using a different set of plates that Nephi started that have the religious part in it to get him off of the hook. But the play, this... The papers never came out. No one ever found them. We assume she did destroy them. Uh, but this is evidently one of the things that Mark Hoffman of the 1980s forgery fame was evidently getting geared up to produce in all of his forgeries. He eventually was evidently working towards bringing out the 116 pages because, boy, if you were going to blackmail the church to buy something that was going to be worth a lot of money, uh, that would really be worth a lot. <laughs> You can come up with those pages. So, uh, anyways, that's a little aside on the Hoffman thing. But our television uh, station number here is nine seven three eight eight two zero nine seven three TV twenty. We invite you to call in and join in the conversation. We've talked about polygamy and Emma's response to it. I've heard the story that Emma was not happy about polygamy. I mean, not only did she deny it later, but I've, I've heard the story that she actually attacked, was it Eliza Snow? Right. Yeah, there's a couple of different accounts of this. And so you have her attacking Emma with a broom or pushing her down the stairs. But um, Eliza was a single woman. 
that the Smiths had invited to come live in their home. Now, you have to understand the Smith home was a large home that they were using as kind of, ho of a hotel. In fact, a number of Joseph's wives were boarding or living in this hotel, mm -hmm. and, which made it very convenient for Joseph. But Emma didn't realize she was housing a number of his wives. Well, Eliza comes to live with them, and Emma figures out that they're married. Now, some people speculate that Eliza was pregnant, but that's how she figured out that they were married. So one of the stories um, go that when she realized this, that she uh, pushed Eliza down a flight of stairs and it caused her to miscarry. And Eliza never did have children. And so this was the story. The reason she couldn't have children is because of a miscarriage at that time. Uh, Eliza is just another example of uh, how people that were very close to Emma, that Emma's truest friends, her closest associates, uh, one by one she found out were married to Joseph. This was a very, uh, very hard thing for her. Uh, in this uh, biography of Emma, they tell about how she goes with uh, Joseph one day on a carriage ride to visit a family, and when she gets to this family's house, she sees that this young teenage girl in the home has a gold watch, and she finds out it's from Joseph Smith, and Emma just goes into a rage because she realizes this means this girl's a plural wife because Joseph had given a gold watch like this to Eliza, <laughs> and now she sees this girl have one, and uh, the, so the story goes that on the, wagon, the uh, buggy ride home, uh, Emma and Joseph got in a horrific fight uh, over Here's another one that he's brought into the fold uh, behind her back and against her wishes. And Brigham Young actually claimed that it was only because Joseph Smith uh, uh, threw up the poison that he was able to survive Emma's attempt on his life. Right. Uh, that, um, and they tell that story in Mormon Enigma about uh, the time that evidently Emma tried to poison him. Um, and there may have been a reconciliation on that one, or if it didn't happen, or whatever. If, if, if it didn't happen, Joseph never set the stra record straight with Brigham Young. He told the council of men that she had tried to poison him. So one can quibble on whether they want to accept the, that it, it, did he just have food poisoning and attribute it to being poisoned by Emma. Regardless of the incident, he accused her of that. In, uh, in front of the whole council of the leadership of the church. Now, this whole issue of polygamy, was Joseph actually practicing polygamy before he officially revealed? I mean, obviously, she's able to deny it later, but had he revealed it at least within the church that they were practicing polygamy, or was it something he was keeping secret from the members themselves? The earliest mention we have of polygamy and Mormonism is 1831. I mean, that's just a year after he starts Mormonism. He gives a revelation secretly to, to a few of his followers that they were to go to Missouri, to Independence, and preach the gospel to the Indians, who they thought were Lamanites, and uh, they were to intermarry with the Lamanite women, and this would help fulfill the Book of Mormon pro prophecy that in the end time the Indians would become white and delightsome. So this is the first hint we have of polygamy and Mormonism. Now, these were married men that were going down that he was instructed to marry the Indian women. We don't have any evidence that any of them ever did, but it's the first hint of polygamy. Uh, then you have to move up <clears throat> into the mid-30s. Obviously, there's some sort of problem going on at that time because in 1835 in the Doctrine and Covenants, they put in a section on marriage uh, denouncing polygamy and saying that they don't practice it. Well, why do they have to put that in there? Obviously, Joseph, rumors of Joseph's affairs or marriages, whatever you want to term them, ha were already happening before 1835, or I don't see why they would have to have that denial in the Doctrine and Covenants. We have with us Matt from Salt Lake City. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a question for Sandra. Um, if you were an LDS viewer of the program tonight, and you're hearing all of these things that don't seem to square up with the sanitized LDS history, um, and you're not really sure where to begin looking. C could you recommend a few good books um, that uh, <laughs> someone could turn to to maybe start looking into the, the actual historical LDS church? Right. The book I have here right now is Mormon Enigma, Emma Hale Smith, and this is written by Linda Newell and Valen Avery. These are Mormon women historians. These are 
not apostates. These are not women writing a book trying to discredit Joseph Smith. I think it's a great place to start. I think every Mormon woman needs to read this book, uh, especially if they're going to go see that movie. They need to read the real story of Emma. Um, her story is a very, uh, you, you feel a lot of empathy for the woman because she suffered so many things, but especially the polygamy part is just horrific. But they don't write this to put Joseph down. I, it's just history. And so I'd say that's a good place to start. Um, I, I guess if you were really wound up in Mormonism and, and thought this might even sound too risque, you could start with uh, Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling, which they sell at Deseret Book. Uh, and even though it is a toned down uh, version of Mormon history, he still tells you a lot of the kinds of things we've talked about here tonight. He just tries to give a softer explanation for them uh, that it wasn't time for things to be revealed and they had to go slowly and, you know, and, and he has his... But when it comes to, like, the um, uh, Joseph Marion women with living husbands, he even struggles to find an explanation for that one. And he says there's just some things we just don't understand. They just accept him as a prophet and say, well, somehow it, it's, you know, God-ordained. So even LDS historians like Bushman will say that Joseph Smith took other men's wives yes. without them ever having divorced. Right. He and, concedes that. And there, it's not just something that's a spiritual thing for the future, but it's actually consummated here. Right, right. And Todd Compton was a, is another Mormon historian who wrote In Sacred Loneliness, uh, the biography of 33 of Joseph Smith's plural wives, and that's another great book for any Mormon who questions the kinds of things we're discussing. I mean, the, what we've discussed here tonight are everyday common things to those in the historical community. These are known things, but uh, it, they just, because of these kinds of movies, the more, average Mormon just goes to the movie. They're not gonna go down to the bookstore and buy Mormon Enigma. <laughs> it just seems striking to me that here's this woman who denies Brigham Young the authority over the church denies that Joseph Smith ever taught or practiced polygamy, denies all these different things, and was, was uh, accused publicly by Brigham Young of having poisoned Joseph Smith, was said at general conference to be on her way to hell, yeah. uh, that because of what she had done in the past, she would burn in hell. Mm -hmm. And now she's being embraced and brought into the fold and, and it, it seems as if all these other things are being forgotten and we have this Hallmark Hall of Fame right. presentation that she's just one of the fold. But this is the whole PR campaign of Mormonism today. They want to sanctify their history. They want to purify Joseph Smith. And in a religion that so emphasizes eternal marriage, how can you have that kind of central doctrine and not have a prophet that has a good marriage? And so they've got to sanitize Emma and Joseph's relationship in order to make them the ideal couple. If everyone would just have an ideal marriage like Joseph and Emma. Um, I mean, Joseph's letters to his family are touching. Uh, he evidently uh, was a loving father to his children. Uh, he wrote loving letters to Emma, and there must have been a lot of days where they had a beautiful relationship. But how can you build an image of him and Emma as having this uh, model for a proper marriage before God, a God-ordained marriage, when you have a man who is lying to his wife going behind her back, marrying her best friends, ma marrying all the girls she brings in to be housekeepers, marrying married women, going to his apostles and asking the apostles to give their wives to him, taking apostles' da teenage daughters as plural wives. I mean, this, and then the fights they have over this. This is not a picture of the ideal marriage. I would hate to be in this marriage situation. <laughs> We have with us uh, Mark from Salt Lake City. Mark, good to have you with us. Uh, I was just curious, uh, Sandra's uh, response to the uh, Richard Bushman. He in in I'm, I'm not sure which uh, Joseph Smith and the origins of Mormonism. 
He refers to the sons of Lehi, and it's Samuel, not Sam. What is your reaction to that? I'm afraid I'm not up on the point there, so I can't respond to that. Oh, oh. well, it's... It, Oh, you mean because of Sam not being a Hebrew word, and he wants to make him Samuel? Yeah, that's what Bushman did in yeah. in, a, in one of his books. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's a funny problem, but yeah, the I don't think the Jews were calling people by abbreviated names. But anyways, yeah, you just have Sam in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Thanks for the call. Uh, we have with us Jim. Jim, good to have you with us. Oh, good evening. Uh, when uh, you were looking at books about uh, uh, polygamy in the church, my wife and I, by the way, are both ex-Mormons. We resigned in the past three years. And uh, uh, Richard S. Van Wagener's book on Mormon polygamy right. was uh, uh, it, it was very hard to read because about six pages into it, it made you want to, to throw up about how, what was going on. But it's a great book. Right. Uh, Mormon Polygamy, A History by Richard Van Wagener. And that's available through the various bookstores as well. Another Mormon historian. And it's a very good historical overview of polygamy. And not just on Joseph Smith's life. His book takes you through Brigham Young's practice of polygamy up through the manifesto. His book shows how the church did not give up polygamy after the manifesto. The church leaders kept taking plural wives after the manifesto. I mean, it was just the average church guy that was told, you guys got to quit. But behind the scenes, the church leaders kept taking plural wives. And so they did the same thing as Joseph. There was this double standard. There was what we said publicly and what was going on privately. And uh, he goes through the polygamy, post-polygamy era, and talks some about the current polygamous groups as well. The Utah church was actually denying polygamy long after they were practicing it, correct? I mean, up until, what, the 1850s in England, they were telling people, no, 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 we're not doing right. this. They didn't publicly admit to polygamy until 1852, but even up until 57, they were still lying about it over in Europe. Uh, and so it, it was a gradual thing of the Mormons finally coming clean in their publications, admitting they practiced it. So they at first lied about its practice, then they lied about giving it up, and it's, it's just a whole history of inconsistency and cover-up. We have with us Mike from Provo. Mike, we're running short on time. Uh, yeah, if you in could the be interest concise. of uh, freedom of speech, like you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. I hope you would let me get out my comment without uh, hanging up on me or something like that. You have to make it very short. We've got a little over three minutes left in the program, and we have to close up. So if you can squeeze it into about 20 seconds, please. For anyone listening to this show, I urge you not to give any credence to anything that's being said. Sandra Tanner obviously has a, an agenda. Her agenda is her livelihood is based on criticizing the LDS Church. Uh, the host, what's your name, Jason? Yes. You you give the appearance of humility and and uh, things like that on TV, but your emails are the rudest emails I've ever seen. I, I would Come be happy. I'd be happy line. to put them. Uh, I, line is Joseph Smith. Hello. I'd be happy to put them uh, up for public inspection. No, everything you say is is lies. Thank you. Um, everything we say, he this, claims is a lie. This is a Mormon author. I am not. The books <laughs> I've mentioned here are Mormon authors. I'm not talking about anything that is not in Mormon books by Mormon authors. I, I, I get so tired of people that if you criticize, you've got an agenda. If you criticize, it must be for money. I, I, got, I got an email from a fellow one time. He says, you must feel really good. I mean, just because we had some links. I think we yeah. had a link to you on, yeah. on our website. Uh, and we had a little bit of, of information on LDS, but we bit over backwards. I mean, we've had, mm -hmm. we've had LDS on here to discuss, and we've done debates where we have LDS that come and appreciate mm -hmm. that we're trying to be fair. Right. But I get this email from a guy saying, you must be really proud trying to sell the gospel. And he says, oh, it's okay. It's just because you probably needed to install a new pool. And I said, well, you know, ironically, <laughs> in God's providence, I did install a pool today. It took me an hour to blow it up. <laughs> I mean, the, 
it, it, it seems incomprehensible to some people that someone could read the Book of Mormon. I mean, when, when people hear that I've read the Book of Mormon three times, cover to cover, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've read uh, Mighty Work and a Wonder, Mormon Doctrine, uh, I, I've read Jesus the Christ, I've read Achieving a Celestial Marriage, I've read all these things, and I say, you know what? It's unbiblical. Right. It's just, it's unfathomable to them. Yeah. I, I, it must be because for, of money. It must be, uh, we, I was told by this same caller, the only reason we had you on was because of ratings. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if you... Oh, I'm glad to think I up them. <laughs> I don't... We don't sell advertising. I don't see how that, anyway. Um, but it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, we, we have some callers we're not going to be able to get to. We've got a minute left in the show. Uh, I, I, I want to explain uh, a little more clearly. The reason we do this is because we believe truth matters. Uh, mm -hmm. Joseph Smith made the claim that he was a prophet of God bringing the restored gospel and the restored church of Jesus Christ. And that claim is either a great truth or a great fiction. And we believe if you compare it to the scriptures, you find it's a great fiction. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into more of this. Sandra, it's very good to have you with yeah. us. Um, this is a production of Christ Presbyterian Church here in Salt Lake. We meet at 8630 West, 2700 South, 11 o'clock Sunday mornings. We also meet 6.30 Sunday nights in Logan at 13.15 East, 700 North. We're going to be discussing more of these things in the future. We have a taped episode next week discussing homeschooling and family worship. I invite you to tune in next week. Until next time, God bless. Yeah.